The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian from Bringing Down Security. This week is part two of our discussion with Kim Crawley. She was here a couple, about, about a week ago on the 13th uh, to talk about her book, which is coming out uh, in paperback on Aug- October the 5th. Sorry, October the 5th. Uh, it's called Eight Steps to Better Security, a Simple Cyber Resilience Guide for Business. Uh, the, the ebook is out currently right now. Uh, if you wanted to go and get it on Kindle, it's uh, uh, 18 bucks on uh, on Amazon Prime. There's a link in our show notes if you want to go grab that. And uh, yeah, we we finish uh, we we finish up talking to her this week about uh, you know asset um, and and testing. And you know the question I I started out by asking is if you're not a security professional, uh, what are what are some of the goals that you should expect when you're wanting to do things like implementing security? So. Um, we're gonna we're gonna jump right in here where I start asking her that question, and uh, hope hope you have a great week. Right, right. And I, I think I think if you're if you're not somebody who's necessarily in security and you pick up your book, um, what's a realistic goal? So let's say you're the you're not a you're not a CISO, you're not a security person. You work at a I don't know startup. You know somebody who does photographs as a service, you know, they, they give us their digital photographs and, you know, we do stuff with them or something, you know, there's a lot of data there, you know, you're processing people's pictures, God knows what you're processing of people's pictures. Um, so there's some, you know, some security, security there and, you know, you as a PM or you as a Develop. graphic designer may realize, Hey, you know, this is some pretty sensitive stuff. Maybe we should be doing, um, as, as somebody in, in that kind of role, what is, what is, how would you set those goals and, and say, you know, hey, boss, here's somebody's, you know, pictures of, you know, their tryst in their bedroom. Why, you know, we're not we're just <laughs> leaving these out on somebody's, you know, file share. I mean, how, how do you, how do you, what, what, is a, what is a logical goal here and how would somebody work towards that if, if you know, they're maybe not even top of, you know, maybe not a CISO or even a manager? Obviously, you and I and most of the people listening to this podcast know that there's no such thing as perfect security. So we can't obviously have perfect security as a benchmark. Improvements, any sort of improvement in your security posture is worth it. Uh, We all understand the concept of security maturity about how it builds over time. Any progress made towards security maturity is good. And I, I explain the security maturity concept in the frequent security testing chapter because you work, you work in pen testing, so you understand that a company needs a certain amount of security maturity for pen testing to be appropriate. Mm-hmm. So yeah, any sort of improvement that that's the end goal. Right. right. But I, I yeah. make it very clear in the book that you, you can't be a company with great security overnight. It's a, it's a process. It takes time. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I was just thinking along the lines of doing things like potentially like gap analysis or, you know, if the goal that you want to do is to make sure that, you know, whatever incremental changes are made, uh, you know, if you're, you know, Hey, you know, we're processing all this information, maybe we should put it in some security or, you know, I, I, I think it would imagine on the location in your, in your organization, how big the, the, the initiative or the security incrementation would be. You need some benchmarks, right? And the benchmarks are going to vary wildly depending on your industry, the size of the company, many other factors. Uh, if your company is a little Android iPhone mobile game developer, for instance, maybe the benchmarks are to make sure that the games that you're developing uh, never leave the company's computers until you're ready to release the game. Mm -hmm. For instance, it could be 
uptime, uptime metrics on your on-premises network, on your cloud network. Uh, you know, I, uptime is a very important security metric as far as I'm concerned, definitely. Right. Um, it could be lots of other, it will, it will vary, right? There's, there's no one size fits all solution. It will vary depending on what you're doing, what kind of computer network you have. But I think security testing is a really important part of determining some of those baselines. I mean, even if a company does not have the security maturity for pen testing, vulnerability assessments are appropriate for all companies, all networks, even from day one. So maybe because vulnerability assessments are generally based on specific security standards. So maybe yeah, yeah. you start with whichever uh, well-known security standards may apply to your organization. Right. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Betcher and I uh, used to work at a company where it was definitely, it seemed like compliance started the security efforts. Um, we, we dealt with some regulatory guidelines and such. And then it was like, the, the problem I saw with the compliance stuff was they only wanted to meet compliance. They didn't want to go beyond that. So uh, trying to, trying to, <laughs> yes, huge problem. Yes. Especially for, especially when you lose one of the, the champions of trying to get all of that stuff implemented, who had been the compliance person. Um, I, I apologize if he's listening. Uh, he, it's not Mr. Betcher. It's not, it's somebody else, but um, if he's listening, I do apologize. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you could have you could have helped us get better, sir. Um, so, anyway, um, but yeah, I, I I find that uh, you know you're often forced to implement security because you've had a bad compliance evaluation, and and that's a sign of maturity, right? If you're big enough where you're actually having to start dealing with those compliance or regulatory requirements, that means somebody's taking notice of your organization, which means you're more important now. Uh, you stand to, you know, have more risk, uh, and uh, the compliance things are to try to help manage that risk or lessen the risk. But um, you can't do that without implementing also some security or doing, you know, threat analysis and risk controls. So, in some situations, a company might not be able to avoid a security audit, like right. PCI, as you keep saying, like PCI DSS. You absolutely must be PCI DSS compliant if you're going to be a Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, et cetera, payment. You don't have to be a payment provider. If you accept those methods of payment and you don't delegate it to a third party like Stripe or whatever, then you absolutely must be PCI DSS compliant. And, you know, if the payment card industry association does a security audit on you they're not going to care that your retail store has only existed for a few months right if they see gross violations with how you've implemented uh your pos system then they might take away your ability to process credit cards right right or they'll they'll charge you more for each transaction which if you're not making a lot of money on those transactions to begin with that can cause you to lose more money in the long run um, um, until you've you've gotten better. So, yeah, uh, that makes that makes sense. Um, cool. Uh, let me see. Uh, no, 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 no. Data protection. Yes. Um, this cloud reader for Kindle is not the easiest thing to use. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. So, I want to go back to section two, chapter two. Uh, I don't know if you had been on uh, on the internets in the last uh, uh, couple of days, but there was a tweet that had come out uh, about a job description. Oh, I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I I don't know how many out. I must have spent a good hour and a half last night on LinkedIn because I was like, I know it's a LinkedIn, so I was trying to filter on entry level. I was trying to you know ten plus years of of, of JavaScript and what have you. Um, but yeah, the when when you when you're talking about the hiring the the security team. My, my wife and I were, were talking about some of this too. And um, we, I think we came to consensus here that we try to hire ourselves, which means we try to hire 
especially in this case, the entry level thing was obviously not an entry level job. It was more, I would say, almost like a senior manager or senior developer in this case, um, looking for an entry level. So they were obviously either trying to hire somebody like themselves uh, or they actually just let entry HR... level 10 years experience HTML5. Right. Uh, seven to 10 years experience with a bunch of other web development technologies. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, yeah. I, I, I worry about that because it's like, if you don't know who or what you need to hire for, how can you effectively hire for a security team? What is, who is the first person you need to hire for your security team? If, if you're building this out, according to your chapter two, who is the first person is it's obviously not a CISO, I would imagine. Well, a small company might not have the resources for dedicated cybersecurity professionals. Uh, in that case, if there is a network administrator, if there's a network administrator okay. and there isn't anyone more senior technical than that, then the network administrator is in charge of your company's cybersecurity. Uh, basically, my criteria is whoever in your company ha is the most senior when it comes to IT that they are in charge of, they are ultimately responsible for your cybersecurity. If you do have cybersecurity professionals, whoever is the most senior cybersecurity professional on the team. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that sounds great. The only problem is you're gonna have the senior IT person with another hat getting paid the same amount of money and now you've added shit ton of stuff to their to their to their plate um instead of high maybe okay instead of hiring somebody new you you know network administrator you're it here's another thirty thousand dollars to take on this new you know job role uh, maybe we give you a new title or something like I, that i know that that is a huge problem in it is people being given too little pay to be responsible for too many different areas of it to work 80 hours a week and it's ridiculous and I, I feel for you. In some like really small companies, like cybersecurity is ultimately a part of all IT ones. You're all dealing with information, it's information technology and securing it is important. Uh, if you just want to make sure that your network is being administered in a secure way, then yeah, that would fall under the network administrator's purview. Um, a text, a desktop support agent or help desk agent, that role could be related to cybersecurity in some way. Uh, if one of the people in your company says, oh, I've got a, I think I've got a virus and it's a help desk agent's job to look, at, look into that problem. Um, if a company is in the situation like you described, though, which is a very, very common problem because companies are cheap, companies right. are cheap. And so they would much rather, yeah, pay one guy a hundred grand to do the job of like five people who should each be paid six figures. Right. Yeah. In that situation, definitely hire a bare minimum of a security analyst. Yeah. Bare minimum. But it'll all depend on what the network admits, what the network, uh, what the network operations are, what the company's operations are like day to day. Right. If you know the network admin is in charge of cybersecurity and cybersecurity has become too much of a too much work for them to be able to do that and be a network admin at the same time, <clears throat> hire someone definitely. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I was thinking along the lines of, you know, um, there are CISOs as a service out there. There, are, There's uh, people that will do part-time CISO work. Uh, company I used That's to work with Leviathan does those, yeah. Um, to some extent, you know, an MSP, I go into MSPs in the right. book a little bit, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, those are, um, if, they, if they can't, if the MSP can't necessarily help you with that, then they can, you know, help you you know, with monitoring or with additional risk reduction, uh, they may also be able to give you advisory counsel to say, okay, you need to hire this person. 
Um, I, I think the bigger issue is we don't necessarily know what we're hiring for. And that's why we get the 10 plus years of Java, you know, client side JavaScript or what have you. Yeah. We just don't know what we want or we're looking for a kitchen sink. And all that does is cause uh, further issues. I, where I get into that in chapter two. Yeah. Uh, the way I approach it is I, I believe the, the mythical cybersecurity skills gap is a myth that doesn't mean that people don't need to train and upskill. I work for a company that is all about cybersecurity training. So there definitely needs to be cybersecurity training of all kinds. Right. The problem is the myth of the cybersecurity skills gap is a company says, we can't hire for this role. We have, we've been looking, we've been posting on LinkedIn, and then you look and it's like, wait a second, you're leaving that role vacant because you want to pay a CISSP 30 grand a year. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah, I, yeah. I, that and the ridiculous job postings, I make up a fictional ridiculous job posting in chapter two. Nice. So okay. the, you know, the 20 years experience with Windows Server 2016, yeah. Too little Top pay, entry years. level role needs to have a CISSP, so on and so forth. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and uh, when you decide to have an IT person, if your company's too small to do security, um, they have to be trained in security. Yeah. You know, you. you in the CISSP, you have their, your CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. So in, in the world of IT now, Prelease, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you take security out of it, all they're interested in is availability, right? That one leg of the triangle. They don't know how important availability, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, confidentiality and integrity are. I, I get sure, into they that. Know of them. I make I make a I make a point of that in chapter two as well. That you know, company companies want obviously a unicorn. They want someone with all the skills from day one. And especially if you demand a lot of like really really niche skills, you're not going to find the person who the job candidate who needs zero training. So it's very, very important to invest in your employees. I even mentioned in the book that companies should sometimes, can, you know, sometimes certifications can be really important, but maybe for some roles, especially entry-level roles, consider hiring someone with no certs. Mm. Consider yeah. for an entry-level role, hiring someone with no certs that shows a lot of promise and pay for their certifications. I know there are some business leaders out there who would hear that and go blasphemy, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I've always, I've always, so I, one of the things that I did, uh, I looked, I looked at the consultancy where I used to work at their job descriptions and they, you know, some of the, some, you know, some of the descriptions for a security consultant was like, must have had experience in a development environment and must be, you know, have <laughs> code commits and stuff like this. And, you know, one of, one of the things that I was working with last year with regards to that, and, and I think we had um, uh, Katie, Katie Mo on was um, people will not apply to jobs that some groups, some groups will not apply to jobs unless they feel like they can tick every box on that list. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then there's some folks, I mean, that will just, oh, I, you know, okay, I, I, I got one of those things. I'll just throw my resume out there. And I mean, and, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. Um, but you, you writing a good job description, I think is, is more than half the battle here. And, it, you know, if we treated it like buying a house, for instance, if you put a house up for $800,000 in a, in a neighborhood that's only $300,000, you're not going to get anybody buying that house. You're going to have to reduce 
what you're wanting or how, you know, what your want or what your ask is until you get into that happy medium. So if you're throwing up like 15 years of Kubernetes experience and then whatever, <laughs> and nobody's, you know, nobody's coming up or you're getting, you know, stuff, I don't know why we're not finding quality applicants. Maybe you should, you know, see what you can do to modify the job description to make it a little more useful. Maybe we don't need 15 years of Kubernetes experience. Maybe we need only 10 or, you know, and, and you know, keep whittling that down. Uh, or, you know, maybe, maybe get on Twitter and ask people, you know, things, Hey, I'm a hiring manager. I'd like to hire for this position. Can I put down 20 years of Kubernetes experience? And they'll, they'll laugh at you, but hopefully you'll find enough people that will be able to tell you probably shouldn't do that. You know, entry level one, two years, maybe, uh, if, if, if any, you know, may, must be able to, you know, understand cloud technologies, for instance, for an entry level position. Um, it, 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 it's really important. And I think, I think social media could help with some of that. If, if, you know, people in companies without a dedicated security team, or maybe even people in a security team at a big company that's having trouble hiring would come on to Twitter and say, do our job descriptions suck? And <laughs> we'll probably tell you yes. And hopefully we'll be kind enough to help you rewrite those. Um, but those are, uh, you know, like writing policies, job descriptions are some that should be looked at on, on the reg to be fixed, especially if, if you know your group is hiring and, you know, you came in and you're like, what I'm doing right now does not reflect in my job description at all. And, um, you know, writing those in such a way to help with better hiring uh, will, will, only, will only help you uh, and your team in the long run, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, let me see. Mr. Betcher, do you have any, any questions? Let's just <clears throat> skip chapter three. Regulatory, come on. Yeah, nobody wants that. Nobody likes that. <laughs> That's not fun. That, nobody, wants, nobody wants to deal with that. Um, now, I, I wanted to skip to number six, where we, you know, we're talking about data assets and data protection. Yeah. But somebody already beat me to it. Well, I mean, there are other components to it too, right? Right? Like, yeah. it's not just inventorying your data assets. I right. go into physical security. We've already mentioned the CIA triad. Mm -hmm. I think every single book that is about cybersecurity in general must mention the CIA triad. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I just, you know, inventorying your data assets is part of it, but I also right. kind of use that step as like a kitchen sink chapter. We mm -hmm. need to cover these other things, everything that, that's related to accessing your data. Uh, people overlook physical security. Physical right. security is very important, right? Yeah. Um, I, I get into topics like business recovery and disaster preparedness and how yeah. how important is disaster recovery and business preparedness in the in the in the world of the cloud? I mean, you know what? There, you know, we have a hurricane, but our stuff is in several accessibility zones, or it's you know on the west coast, and we're three thousand miles away. I mean, uh, is is availability and resilience um, still as important now that most everybody's in the cloud, or does it only matter if you still do the on prem thing? Um, obviously, there are a lot of companies where, you know, most of their network is in Amazon's data center or Microsoft's data center or Salesforce's data center. But that company, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter how much of a company's network is on the cloud. They're going to need at least something on their premises, uh, maybe a few endpoints mm. on their premises. Bare minimum, they'll have a couple of endpoints on their premises. Right. Um, if you, you know, if your company's office was in uh, Lower Manhattan and they just had those really colossal floods, mm. well, right. it's great that most of your company's data is on Amazon servers, but if your employees can't show up for work because their computers and your on-premises have been flooded. You're going to have to build a new office to, in order to access your Amazon network again. Right, right. Yeah, I guess if your VPN concentrator was, you know, somewhere in an office that got flooded, then your your SOL. Yeah, that makes sense. 
but that's why everybody's doing zero trust now, right? <laughs> yeah, zero trust <laughs> is a great concept when it comes to authentication, right? But floodwater, <laughs> floodwater Flood? doesn't care about perimeter or uh, you know authentication or floodwater just floods. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So you have uh, to think about. Like if you have just one vendor like Amazon um, for the cloud, well, what if Amazon decides one day they're not going to host your stuff anymore and they're going to shut you down? Maybe Excellent CEO question. CEO said something that they don't like or whatever, right? I mean, right? I think I mentioned that it's very important to have local backups hmm. that might not be feasible for a lot of companies. They may not have enough local data storage to back up everything they have on the cloud. A lot of companies are, I, I find a lot more common these days, companies are pursuing a multi-cloud approach. Right. The problem, one of the problems with multi-cloud is to convince your company that you should be paying for multiple cloud providers though. And then it's integrating it all, so. Right. Yeah. redundancy is crucial so i make a big i make a big deal about redundancy in chapter six cool yeah if you can have a multi-cloud environment and full on-premises local backups that's ideal it might not be feasible for all companies so obviously yeah um about a month ago, I think me and Miss Berlin, I think this is while I was on vacation, we uh, we posted the show about uh, doing incident response. Or no, Mr. Betcher and I did the one on incident response. Um, we talked about budgeting for, you know, everybody's like, oh, test your backups and everything. And it's like, well, that takes time, effort, and resources, which you may end up having to pay for depending on which cloud you're in. Uh, you know, that that's that's additional, you know, time and effort uh, that that you probably haven't budgeted for. Uh, and that happens on top of all the other things. So, um, you know, min reminding, you know, your IT department or your security department to budget for testing your backups on a semi-regular basis uh, is, is just something that, you know, oh, I didn't think of doing that. That's a great idea. Um, or, oh, we need to, you know, to, to, you know, restoring those backups may find issues, which would then, you know, cost you more money because it's like, oh, well, we, we did the backups, but it didn't, fix X, Y, and Z, or, you know, um, you know, those, those are things that will, will bite you in the ass if you actually have to implement them and you've never tested them and you find out, oh, we lost firewall config or, you know, oh, we lost all these things and we didn't back up the right things or, uh, what have you. So, um, budgeting for that time, effort, uh, resources are, are, are all very important, uh, for, uh, for, for resilient, uh, uh, organizations. Um, of course you could also just, you know, flip a switch and move from one AZ to another, or like you said, uh, you know, move from one cloud to another, um, um, you know, they, they do offer, you know, 99 plus percent uptime, but, you know, it's still, you know, your, your ass on the line, if your cloud provider can't, you know, manage those, those up, uptime um, uh, deals. Plus, you know, it reduces the chances of malware, supposedly. So, um, you know, you, you can do local backups, but even with the ransomware stuff, you know, if you've got to restore from backup, it's still going to cost you some money. Hopefully your local backups are only connected to your network when you're transferring data. That is correct. <laughs> that would, that would make, that would make the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I think, I think we're getting close to time here. Uh, was there any, any other parts of the book that you wanted to highlight before we left? I know in chapter nine, you kind of bring it all together into one nice, uh, nice bow, you know, yeah. tied, tied up with a bow. What does that look like in this chapter case? Chapter uh, nine is for the busy business person who has hopefully read the rest of the book and just needs a reminder of what ideas are in each of the eight steps. So I basically, chapter nine, the afterward is literally a Cole's note version of the rest of the book. And I also recommend books on each of the areas for further reading, because this book is an introduction to preparing your business to be more cyber resilient. So if you want to explore any of the facets or ideas in my book further, I recommend other books as well. Nice. Very nice. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Betcher, any other thoughts before we before we take off for the the evening? No. Okay. Um, well, uh, like, like we said, uh, the book is available on Kindle format now, uh, as of, uh, 12 September, uh, the paperback version, if you want that will be out five October, uh, 2021. And, uh, the audio book will be uh, forthwith as soon as uh, we figure out who's going to be doing the audio book. Uh, I did volunteer for it, but I don't have a good voice. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants quarter to... 2021 or first quarter 2022. Okay, that's very cool. Uh, how many pages does this book have? Because a little over two hundred, I think two hundred seventeen, okay. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hey, look, the cloud reader has uh, locate. Uh, the one thing I never did like about Kindle was they gave you locations instead of page numbers, but it looks like they have page numbers now. So um, I don't know if they're counting the entire book, but they do say two hundred and five. So I don't know if they're counting things like table of contents and index and what have you. But uh, yeah, two hundred and five. Um, you know, and this may be a, this may be a great book that you would want to potentially give your non-security boss for Christmas. Perfect. Because that's, that, that, that was, I was thinking that that's my audience, business people, not necessarily technical people. Right. Right. But find out if they like audio or they prefer paper, Kindle. That, or they right. prefer a paper book cop paperback copy to be shoved in the CEO's office. Right. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> and also in the insert, you know, on the bookmark, right. www.breakingdownsecurity.com forward yeah. slash, you know, the, the, the episode with Kim Crawley on it. So they can hear from the, the, the speaker. So, um, so, so Kim, are you going to be speaking virtually or in person anywhere in the near future? I know, uh, I know the COVID stuff. I is still, don't you know, know the when this episode is going to be released, but I have my own cybersecurity event called DisinfoSec. Oh. And this year's event is taking place uh, this coming Saturday, September 18th. Okay. Uh, so if, I don't know if this episode releases after that, uh, the YouTube videos will be up. Okay. If you if you miss the event, but if this episode was released earlier, uh, go to disinfosec.tech. D i s i n f o s e c dot t e c h, and it the the gimmick that I have with this event that differentiates it from other cybersecurity events is it's all disabled people talking okay. about security. Disinfo.tech. It's a, yeah, it's a disinfosec.tech. It's a yeah, disinfosec.tech. Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, part one of this, and I'll make sure I mention this uh, on episode, on the first episode uh, um, that this is happening. So uh, this will, this will come out hopefully in the next day or so. That way we'll be able to, to get that. So uh, this part of the show will be on the same weekend as dis disinfosec uh, dot uh, tech uh, conference. Yeah. So, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully people will have gotten notice ahead of time. And, and this is a virtual event, yeah. Yeah, completely virtual. Okay, All right. switch so, YouTube. Um, yeah, disinfosec dot tech. Yeah. Oh, MongoDB is a supporter. That's pretty cool. Good for them. Yeah, I got a okay. corporate sponsor, and I wasn't even looking for one. Fantastic. Okay. And I'm assuming you're going to be doing this. It says, oh, you're going to be doing it on YouTube and Twitch. So if you yeah. don't have a YouTube or a Twitch account, uh, go, go get that, uh, you know, get that set up if you don't have one. I mean, everybody's got a YouTube account probably, but um, not everybody has a Twitch uh, or, or cannot always see those things. So, and um, so how would they, how would they find you if they wanted to know more about disinfosec.tech or uh, maybe the book itself? That's uh, maybe the URL, disinfosec.tech. That's the URL of the website. So, okay. All the information is on the website. Okay. And uh, at disinfosec on Twitter as well. Um, yeah, and if yeah there to... is a disinfosec Twitter. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. And if they wanted to talk to you specifically about the book or, hey, you know, this was a great book, a little, you know, feedback. Uh, how would you I get live it? on Twitter. So uh, okay. yeah, just, just message me via my username on Twitter is Kim, K-I-M underscore Crawley, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y. And I am on Twitter at all times that I'm not bathing or sleeping pretty much. So best way to get okay. a hold of me. <laughs> That's good to know. Good to know. And also uh, make sure you check out uh, Hack the Box uh, blog as well. 
um, they're, they're pretty awesome people. So, uh, yeah, you know, go and go and, uh, go and learn something. So there you go. Um, Mr. Betcher, talk about, uh, talk about what you do on, on, on the regular basis is a full-time job, but, um, I have a piece of software that helps with incident response. Oh, that's and, very uh, important. Yes. And it's called log MD, right? Yep. Log dash MD.com is the website. So go check it out. It's free. Uh, you can yep. download it and uh, run it for Windows systems to find uh, a lot of things that you wouldn't normally find when the Windows by yep. default um, doesn't log very much at all. So that'll help you, guide you in the right direction to set you up just... Windows in a way that if some event happens, then you'll be better able to find out what it was. You just right. solved a really big problem with that application. It's, what's that? What's that? Proper Windows logging. Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So check out the website. It'll tell you how to implement uh, proper Windows logging um, through either group policy or all the ad ad advanced settings that LogMD and and uh, where Michael and I have documented. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, and you're on Twitter where? At Betcher Pwned, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. Excellent. All right. Um, your um, so for those of you who listen regularly, um, we had one episode uh, before this one uh, that was a sponsored podcast with Blue Mara. Uh, we had uh, Miss Berlin, who works with Blue Mara, had said that their marketing people wanted to come and do a, a talk. And, and so we're entering into a limited partnership with them to do some uh, discussions, kind of like how we did with Lumio last year. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're, uh, we might have inferred a specific product that likes to modify log, you know, parameters and logging in Windows boxes during that, that show, Mr. Betcher. So you might want to you know, keep an eye out on that. So, yeah. um, yeah, so Miss Berlin, uh, you know, she she does a lot of work and uh, advocacy for mental health uh, in in our industry, which is is always helpful. Uh, she's done a few workshops this year in the physical sense uh, at uh, uh, Hacker Summer Camp. Uh, she also did one at Blue Team Con. Uh, I want to say they were going to do one at Wild West Hackenfest uh, until it went virtual. Um, she may still be doing something with them. I, I'm, I am unsure, but if you are interested in knowing more about the mental health initiatives that Ms. Berlin and her uh, org are doing, uh, you can follow them on Twitter at Hackers Health, uh, and you can follow Ms. Berlin at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Uh, she also has a, a tabletop uh, incident response game uh, based on a famous RPG uh, uh Celts and countrysides or uh, dwarves and Darrow, Darrow Welfs and stuff like that. Um, you know, using, you know, die, die 20, uh, die 10, die, die six, those kinds of, uh, you know, role-playing type games. And uh, um, you can, uh, you can send her a, a tweet if you're looking for uh, training on how to do proper incident response tabletops. So, or, you know, just a little fun little thing. So she's doing some workshops with those as well. Um, so yeah, uh, the podcast, you can follow at BreakSec, uh, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. And I'm on Twitter as well at Brian Break, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, we just had, well, we, 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 we had, uh, we finished up InfoSec Camp Out. Uh, like I said, we've already uh, been um, uh, working on that. It's going to happen next year in 2022, August 26th to 28th up here in Seattle, same uh, location as last, as this year's. Um, it went really well, and we're looking to expand that out to 50 plus campers. So it'll be pretty fun if you want to come and do a camp out. Uh, we're going to be in anything between RVs all the way down to motorcycles and one person pup tents. So um, we'll have more information on infosetcampout.com uh, coming up, but uh, that's our that's our official website. And um, cool. So. Um, Thank you to our Patreon supporters for uh, the money we uh, use to offset uh, domain registration fees, Zoom accounts, uh, hosting, Libsyn, 
uh, etc. The you know, and just time and effort of getting out a weekly podcast. It's uh, very important. Uh, um, you know, our podcast is always free, and we appreciate all the money in the tip jar that people put in uh, to help support us on that. Um, we have a, a T Pub store. We have a couple of uh, T-shirts over there. Um, and you can also get things like mugs and masks and stickers and such, which are actually pretty good, pretty good quality t- uh, t-shirts and, and stickers, but uh, uh, you can go check that out, uh, tpub.com forward slash user forward slash BDS underscore podcast. And um, yeah, I just, just want to thank everybody for listening, uh, their continued listenership. Uh, we wouldn't have much of a podcast if nobody listened. And, you know, it's important that we have folks like, you know, the caliber of Kim Crawley here coming on, uh, knowing that, uh, you know, her, her message is going to get out there and, and people are going to be listening and buying her book. And um, so if you, uh, you know, uh, have, it, have the time and the effort, uh, you know, go get that book. I mean, it or counts the to need. CPEs as well. What's that? Or the need. Or the need, right? Yeah, um, yeah. These these podcasts counts towards uh, like things like CISSP credits. So uh, an hour is a CPE, and you know if you need those because you're not able to go to conferences, um, or you know you're just not digging the the virtual conference thing. Podcasts are a very good way of doing that, um, and uh, they definitely do take them. So um, anyway, that's it. Uh, I think for breaking down security, Kim. Thank you so much for coming on. As always, uh, you know. I, I would love to talk to you more about your about Hack the Box and how we might be able to help out uh, with that, if at all possible, in the future. If you wanted to come on and talk about blog posts yeah. or something, I'd be more than willing to have you on to talk about those things uh, if you'd Hit like. Me up um, on Twitter. <laughs> I will definitely. Uh, I would definitely do so. Um, Mr. Betcher, it's always a, a pleasure as always, sir. Thank you uh, for coming on. And uh, yeah, that was it for Breaking Down Security. Have a great week. Be kind to one another. Uh, Take care of yourselves. Get yourselves masked and vaxxed and uh, wash your hands, you nasties. And, uh, you know, because it's all about taking care of yourselves and everyone around you. Uh, You know, uh, we we often forget about that. But, uh, you know, one of of the big things about taking care of everybody is first taking care of yourself. Uh, Because, you know, as we always say here, you're the only you you have. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.